So this computer was the first computer I ever owned. I got it for Christmas when I was 10, and I have to say it was one of the more formative toys of my life. I have strong memories of playing with it, carrying around the neighborhood to my friend's house, and generally trying to figure out how it worked. Today, I'd like to walk down memory lane and explore what this computer is capable of, and then see if I can use all the technical skills that I have developed since I was 10 years old in order to program this computer with my very own games. So I've wanted to do this video for a while. A few years ago, my parents were cleaning out the attic of their house, and they found something in this attic that I used to have when I was a kid. Specifically, it was this. This is my teammate game computer, which I got when I was about 10. Uh, this computer was made by a company called Logix. It was released in, I believe, in 1980, and I believe I got it for Christmas that year. I don't remember precisely. Um, but what I do remember is that I played with this all the time. It was my first computer. It, this was it. Um, now, if you dig into it, you'll, one thing you'll realize is not it is a computer, but it's not really a programmable computer. It has several programs built into it already that you can activate by pressing on these keys. And then you can also set various parameters to programs to change the behavior. And that made me feel like I was programming this computer. Reality, I wasn't. I couldn't change the actual programs. I was just setting parameters. But I had fun. And this is probably one of the more formidable toys of my childhood because it certainly set me on a path of being fascinated with technology and ultimately wanting to build computers and program computers and just be in that total scene. Now, if you take a look at this computer, you can see it, it's not much. It has a screen, these four by four LED screen, pretty high res for today for, for sure. It also has this key bed here, which has hexadecimal and then a few four program keys. If you open up the battery compartment, you can see, you can actually see the processor right there. That is something called a Mostec 3870. And I'll get in, be getting into more detail about that later in this video. It has these two hexadecimal seven segment display to be able to produce outputs. And it took batteries. You, you would put four D batteries in this in order to power it. So it, it was pretty interesting, and I was certainly fascinated when I was a kid. I remember just opening this up and looking at it, trying to figure out how to work. To that end, the maker of this computer actually it came with this pretty detailed booklet. Of course, it covered all of the all of the um, games that I actually had built into it, but it also had this section in the middle about computer anatomy. And it went in pretty good detail about the computer anatomy, covering everything from how, you know, the bits and bytes work, how, how to do binary counting, how to do hexadecimal math, or binary math, that is, and to all other, other parts of the computer, including, you know, what I've, I remember reading, I, I distinctly remember reading about this part, paper tapes. Certainly, the era. This was the late 1970s, early 80s, so paper tapes are still very much part of it all. Um, I remember reading that book very closely and studying it and imagining in my head that I could program this computer and actually make it do what I wanted to do and had many hours of fun with that. But reality is, I couldn't actually program it. But today, the goal of this video is to change that. That's my goal, is to actually, for the first time, program my teammate game computer for real, for real this time. Actually load it up with my own program, uh, make it do what I want it to do. Now, I'm going to have to go through several steps to figure that out. First of all, I'm going to have to figure out all this stuff. You know, I'm going to have to reverse engineer the electrical circuit, figure out what's connected to what in order to understand how to program it. The second thing I need to do is that MOSDEC 3870 that I talked about. It's actually not programmable. Now, what it is, is something like an Arduino of today. It is a microcontroller. It has a ROM. It has a little bit of RAM. And you could program it with assembly code that you load into the ROM. The problem is the ROM is inside of that microcontroller. And so you can't program, reprogram it, that is. It is not an erasable ROM like an Arduino of today is. So. I'm going to have to figure out how to make it programmable and how to actually load it with new code. And we'll get into that in this video, how, uh, how I will actually do that. One thing I will also do is, you know, this has been sitting in my parents' attic, I'm going to guess, for at least 35 years. And so 
it, 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 I don't know if you can see it that well in the video, but it, it's kind of dirty. So I'm gonna clean this up, refurbish it some. One thing I'll point out is this uh, battery cover, which is this uh, red plastic. Somehow it got melted at some point during the years. I, this happened when I was a kid. I actually remember this being melted when I was a kid. I don't remember how, it was probably me. Um, but I'm gonna have to figure out how to fix that. And generally just generally refurbish that. So that's the goal for today's video. Um, let's get into it. Before we start taking this apart and doing all the other things I need to do to program this, let's just take a closer look at the Teammate game computer as it is. The first thing I'll point out is the LEDs, the four by four LED screen. This is where all the output for the computer was presented and is where most games were played. There's also a speaker, as you can see by the speaker grill here, and this thing would emit sounds. The keypad, as I pointed out earlier, is a hexadecimal keypad with four program keys. And then there's, of course, this on-off switch to turn on and off. Inside is the battery compartment. Here, four D batteries were placed in it. You can see the two seven-segment LEDs displays that were used for displaying hexadecimal numbers. And you can see the couple other parts of the computer itself. This right here is the Mostec 3870. This is the actual mic microcontroller that runs the computer. There's a few other parts here uh, from a capacitor to some transistors. Uh, this is a line driver, uh, I believe, and I'll figure this out when I do the schematic. I believe it drives the LEDs up on the screen, but we'll see when I take this apart and figure out the electrical schematic of it all. Let's go ahead and see if this still works. Let me put in the batteries. And we'll put the cover back on, even though it's not the, the best shape. And let's turn it on. So I have the book right here. Uh, let's open it up and do the SAMP demo program that it tells you to do when you first start it up. So the way you program this thing was to, you press, these program keys to kind of tell you what it's going to enter, enter a program code, and then some parameters to the program. Here's the example right here. You press the P3 program key, type in 81, hex 81 that is, uh, press P1, then a speed code, and then P1 again to get the program going. So let's, let's go ahead and try that. P3, 81, then I press P1, Oh, you can see it's already running. It has a nice little display. I remember being a kid and being absolutely oohed and odd by that. Now let's go ahead and let's try out the sound. Uh, there are programs in here for playing sound. Um, let's go find one. So to play the new thing was press P3. That sets it into, I want to identify what program we're going to play. Uh, I'm going to do 8E. Uh, you can see that the E <laughs> overtook. That means I probably have some contact problems in these keys. So when I open it up, I'm going to have to clean out the contacts for these keys so this works better. So let's try to get that again. Well, that's something I'm going to fix. Okay, All right, I finally got 8E in there. Press, P, press P1. Okay, enough of that. So clearly it is working. Um, so let's uh, start figuring out how to program this. I also need to open this up, take it apart, and reverse engineer the electrical schematic. Part of what I need to do is get this circuit board here out so I can see the other side and see what's connected to what and kind of develop a schematic off of that. Once I reverse engineer this device, I'm going to have to figure out how to program it. I'm going to have to figure out how to change the program that's in this the ROM of this microcontroller and set it myself. Now, I have already looked up some details about how to change the program on this, and the short of it is I can't. I can't change the program that's in this microcontroller. But what I can do is change that microcontroller out with this one here. This is the Mostec 38P70, 
So while this is the Mostec 3870, this is the Mostec 38 P70. And one of the things that should stand out right away is that you see that it has the socket on top of it. This was intended to be a programmable version of the Mostec 3870, and it does not have a ROM built into it. Instead, you would attach a ROM on top of it, which you programmed yourself. So that is going to be the technique I use in order to program this. I'll replace this Mostec 3870 with this programmable one and then set the ROM that I want and that has the programs that I want to run. But what I do need to do is figure out how to get the contents of this ROM out so that I can just preserve it for posterity. So that will be a project unto itself in, in reverse engineering how to get the ROM out of that Mostec 3870. Okay, let's open this up, disassemble it, and start the process of reverse engineering the actual circuit. Start, let's uh, turn this off. Take out the batteries. Okay, the first thing I think we need to take off is, you see these two screws right there. Those screws out. Let's see if we can pull that bottom off. Indeed I can. And there's that circuit. Interesting, it looks like it's got some kind of a uh, card edge going on there, but I don't quite know what it would be connected to. Another thing to know is that this top comes off. These, in fact, when I got it as a kid, I had to put that together. Once I get that, it seem there we go. <laughs> Looks like they glued the parts together. I will have to remember that technique. Just use some hot glue, put it all back together. Fascinating. I already identified a manufacturing flaw. If you look closely right here, right there, uh, one of the leads coming out of the seven segment display is not soldered. So when I uh, break down the schematic, I'll figure out why this was never noticed. Uh, maybe it has, maybe it's the decimal point. I don't know off the top of my head. Looking at this, one thing that kind of stands out, this looks, this definitely looks hand soldered. So when these things were manufactured, I think someone was sitting there soldering it all together by hand. You can actually see the rosin that uh, was left after the solder melted. Certainly this was hand, hand soldered. Okay, let's open up the back of the screen. See what we have here. And one last thing to open up, which is the keys. Okay, that's the switching mechanism. It's using cellophane tape to hold these metal discs that look like they... Uh, are easily deformed in place. Okay, if you look closely, you can see what's probably wrong with these keys. You can see that this tape mechanism, tape that they use to hold the, the parts down, well, has accumulated junk underneath. It's actually uh, kind of either the tape itself has uh, corroded some, or just dirt has got in there, and that's probably what's messing with the contacts. So I'm going to have to. Probably take this tape off, clean everything up real good, and then just use tape again and put it back down. So I'm going to do the reverse engineering for the schematic of this electrical circuit off camera. I'll check in here and there, kind of show you the progress uh, how as I figure it out. But for now, just the tedious work of trying to figure out where all these lines connect to each other. 
in order to create the schematic that I need. Okay, so I have reverse engineered most of the teammate computer already. Here is the schematic that I've figured out so far. The only thing I haven't figured out yet is the keypad. Now, I know how the keypad is connected to the Mostec 3870 using these connection points right here. That's what these connection points that I've drawn actually represent, and I know how they're connected to the 3870. What I haven't done is figure out this whole mess of lines that you see in the PCB here. So to figure that out and to clean the, the contacts that are underneath these buttons here, I'm going to go ahead and take this apart. Now, as I pointed out earlier, this looks like just cellophane tape that's holding down these metal contacts. These are spring-like contacts. If I push one, it, I'm assuming underneath there's a metal pad that it makes contact with. And so I'm going to take the cellophane off, pull these out, clean this up. And then while I have all these button contacts off, I will map out the uh, PCB and figure out what's connected to what. I write up on the best ways to get the cellophane off. Other than just pulling it off, you can use some alcohol in order to kind of clean, up, clean it up some. So I'm going to see how far I can get with just pulling it off. And if I need to, I will grab some alcohol and start cleaning it up. So let's just get started. Yeah, that came off really easily. And let's uh, see what happens when I pull this up. So it looks like they get pushed into these little holes. Huh, let's see how that works. I was wondering why all these lines go into one contact, and now I see that it's just a routing issue. There's only one contact, one line that's going into these. But, you know, you can see all these others. You see all these lines that go into the button area. I originally thought that somehow they're all connected, but it's just routing. So let's uh, continue. Okay, there we go. I've gotten the tape and the uh, push button tabs on top of the each of these contact areas taken off. And now I can see exactly what wire goes to what location. This should be easy to reverse engineer now. I think one of the first things I'm going to do is try to clean this PCB a little. Uh, make sure these contacts and actually these uh, buttons here are clean so that when I put it back together, I don't have any problems with contacts like I was having earlier when I was demonstrating the teammate computer. I'm going to start off with some uh, flux remover just to see how good that is. Try a little bit right here, see how it goes. Actually, that seems to be doing it nicely. So I'm going to keep that up. That is much cleaner than it was when I took it apart. I'm going to assume that means the contacts are going to work better, but we'll test that out before I put it all back together. So my next step here is I'm going to map out the, all these lines to figure out what the actual electrical schematic of all these switches are. I'm going to do that off camera just because it's slow and tedious. Uh, catch up with you soon. Okay, so I have fully mapped out this keypad circuit. It's actually quite ingenious what they're trying to do is keep all of their circuit on one side of the PCB. So it's a single sided PCB. And to do that, to be able to connect to these various points or outer rings, they had to route some of these lines through this ring in some manner. And uh, I don't know, it, it, it just was kind of ingenious. The length they went through in order just to have a one sided PCB. Hopefully it saved them a lot of money. But then again, this is 19, late 1970s tech, so. I'm sure someone drew this by hand at that time in order to make it. Anyway, with this uh, figured out, I now have a complete schematic of my teammate game computer. So let's take a look at that schematic. Here is the overall schematic of the computer. 
You can see in the middle is the Mostec 3870 microcontroller. This is the heart of it. That's what's controlling everything. To the right of that, you see this uh, DS8871IC. What that is is a line driver. It allows the Mostec 3870 to control LEDs and other illumination, other displays, without requiring the Mostec 3870 itself to drive the current needed in order to illuminate the LEDs. So this is just a line driver. It's much like a bus buffer that you may see uh, in other designs like my TTL computer that I've previously talked about. That's all this is. But it's an older chip. It's not a modern chip. This is clearly a 1970s chip that is used to do the line driver. Also, it's interesting to note that it's a inverting chip. That is, if I put a one on the left-hand side, I will get a zero on the right-hand side. But that's actually what we want here because um, that's what will actually turn on a light. You'll notice this if you look at the seven segment displays I have here. It's actually a common anoid design, which means the individual segments are turned on by providing a sink or a the path to ground for the positive power that comes into the common connection down here in the lower right of each of these units. Now you'll notice on this Mostec 3870 IC here that all of these outputs are inverting already. That is, it has the line over it that indicates they're inverting. So you're going to have to think through that. If I want the LED light to turn on, what value do I need to put on the port in order to make that work? Well, it turns out the value I need to put on the port will be zero because if I, if I write a zero to this port, it's going to be presented on this line as a one, uh, which will then get inverted by the line driver here into a zero, which will ultimately turn things on. So I've already pointed out these two hex displays. I also have this LED array. I'll talk about it. I actually made this a sub-module in this KiCad design. So I will, I will get to that in the future. But one thing I do want to point out before I do that is notice these four transistors here. So what these transistors are doing are providing the positive power to any given unit. There are two that go to the LED array, and there is one each for each of the hex displays. So what this tells me, without having to look at the software yet, this tells me that the teammate computer is multiplexing. That is, at any given time, one of these items are actually illuminated. And it does it so quickly that your eyes don't actually notice the blinking, but there's multiplexing going on. So I'll be looking for that when I reverse engineer the software for this thing. The other thing to look at is this speaker here. That's the speaker that was in the uh, display unit of the device. It's interesting to look at this circuit that is clearly being driven by a PWN signal coming out of this port 5-0 line. It goes through an inductor to kind of smooth out that signal a little. And then a PNP transistor on the low side of the speaker in order to control when current is going through the speaker or not and thus making a sound. I found it interesting that they put a PNP transistor on the low side. I had to look up, you know, what's going on. This is actually referred to as a voltage follower circuit. So the emitter of the transistor will never be at a voltage below what's at the base. So if I have a high going into this transistor, that emitter will be held at, at a high level. Thus, no current will be flowing through the transistor and the, eventually the speaker is off. And so when I put a low on this transistor, then the voltage at the emitter will be brought down to zero and thus a current can flow through the speaker, thus making a sound. Doing that at the right frequency will make a particular tone, and thus that's why I know this is the PWN so signal coming out of the Mostec 3870. The other point of this design is right down here in the lower left, what I call the, the teammate keypad. This represents all the lines that were on the keypad module that I just showed, and so I'll get to that. The final thing to look on this schematic is the upper left-hand corner. This is the power management. Uh, this is driven by batteries, 6 volts worth, so it's 4 D batteries, which would produce ultimately 6 volts since they're in series. It gets routed through this diode. I don't know what version of the diode is. I have to do some more testing to figure it out, but it's clear to me why they're doing it. The first purpose is to if someone puts the batteries in backwards, it'll prevent any kind of backwards current and thus not fry any of the electronics. But what I think is the real reason for it is it's actually doing a voltage drop. So every diode has a forward voltage. And so what would be a, the voltage on the right-hand side of this diode would be some level less than the voltage that goes on the left-hand side. I'm going to guess that this forward voltage for this diode is about, about one volt, or maybe a little bit more. I have to test it yet to figure out exactly what it is. But the reason why I'm guessing that 
is that it will set this VCC value, or the VCC that's used by all the chips, to about 5 volts, which is exactly what the MOSTEC 3870 needs. And so that's why I think they put that diode there. It's in order to drop the voltage of the battery down to 5 volts or slightly less so that the MOSTEC 3870 gets the correct voltage for its operations. Looking at the LED array, you see it's quite simple. It has two common anodes, that is two positive power supplies. The A1 power supply supplies power to the LEDs on the right side of the screen, and the A2 power supply supplies power to the LEDs on the left hand of the screen. So the way this is likely going to work is that at any given time, only the LEDs from the right side or the left side are on, because only one of these will be on. Now, technically, they both could be on at the same time, but that's not how you do multiplexing, so I, I don't believe that's exactly what they're doing. So this is another detail to understand when I go to write software for this, is how to create an image on the screen. I will have to be using multiplexing. And finally, here's the keypad circuit that I was able to reverse engineer through inspection on the keypad. First of all, this switch here that I marked P3, which corresponds to the P3 button on the actual teammate game computer, you'll see that it has its own circuit. It goes into this KP1 and KP2 line. So if I go back to the actual overall schematic, you'll see that those KP1 and KP2 lines actually go into the reset circuit line of the MOSTEC 3870. So now that tells me by pressing this button here, what you're actually doing is resetting the MOSTEC 3870, which kind of makes sense. To start a new program, all you do is reset the computer, enter the com code for that program you want to run, and off you go. The other thing to notice is that there's multiplexing going on here too. If you look closely, the keys on the bottom four rows, which represent all the hexadecimal values on the keypad, they're actually broken up into two banks that are interleaved with each other. And through that, I can figure out which key is pressed by actively changing which bank is active in order to sense which key is pressed down. Finally, the P1, P2, and P4 buttons are all in their own circuit, and you can figure out which ones are pressed by inspecting what's going on with these last three lines, KP11 through KP13. So that's the schematic for the teammate computer. It's fairly straightforward, fairly simple. You know, it's centered around the MOSTEC 3870 and its connection to the keypad and its connections to the LED array and the 7 segment displays. Should be easy to program. So let's move forward and get into that problem. Okay, now that this keypad PCB is all clean and I've cleaned up all the metal buttons, let me put this PCB keypad back together and then test out the test it out. See if it still works. So I have all the buttons in place now. But before I test this out, I need to tape them down so they don't fall off while I'm testing it. As you recall, when this, the way the manufacturer originally kept these down was to use cellophane tape. I'm not going to use cellophane tape. I'm going to use Captain tape. Similar concept, a little bit more suited for electronics. So let's get this tape down. Yeah, tape's in place. Looks good. Now let's test this out. Okay, we're ready to test. Now I have my power supply set to 6 volts. The reason for that is that this thing is run by 4D batteries, which add up to 6 volts. But the goal of this test is to make sure that this keypad is operating as I would expect. So let's hook it up to power. Uh, this battery tab was negative power. And then uh, this battery tab was positive power. And looks like we have life. Um, we got the X pattern, zero, zero hex. So this is the orientation of the keypad. And if you remember from the original uh, layout, these are the P keys, P1, P2, P3, P4, and then these are the hexadecimal 
from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, and 0. So let's remember that. Remember, we press P3 to set it in program mode. I'm going to do 8, 1, which was the, just the basic program. 8, 1. Oh, that works much better now. And then P1 to start. I have to put it in a speed code. Uh, let's go with uh, 5, 5. Then P1. There we go. The program is running. So it's working. And I can tell from um, just using it right now, this worked so much better. So it was good that I cleaned this keypad. When I put the get back together, it will work great again. Okay, great that it works. Now, the next thing I wanted to do, if we recall from my start of the video, is that I want to dump the ROM that's on this MOSTEC 3870. To do that, I'm going to need to get this ROM out. Now, the good news is it's socketed. So I just need to pop this out of the socket, and then I can work on dumping the ROM. So let me do that off camera, and I'll get back to you shortly. Okay, there we go. I've got the MOSTEC 3870 popped out. Here it is. Now, the next thing I need to do is dump this ROM. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about this MOSTEC 3870. The MOSTEC 3870 microprocessor is the 1970s version of a microcontroller, much like today's Arduino is. The chip is derived from the Fairchild F8 processor. I'm not going to go into much detail on the F8, but the YouTuber Hello World made an excellent video on the history of the F8 CPU. I encourage you to watch it as it gives a lot of context into how the MOSTEC 3870 came into being. The specs for the MOSTEC 3870 are, it has 1 to 4K bytes of ROM, depending on how it was set up. It has 64 bytes of scratch pad RAM and an option for 64 additional bytes of executable RAM. It has 32 bits of I.O. This is what the microcontroller was really focused on, being able to interface with the outside world and affect reactions to it. And it took a single 5 volt power source. Now, this may seem normal to most people today, but this was actually revolutionary at the time because most CPUs in the 1970s required multiple voltage levels. So, creating this MOSTEC 3870 such that it only required one 5 volt input was revolutionary and it enabled it to be easily used in many different devices. One question that might arise is how one can program the ROM on the MOSTEC 3870. Those of you who are familiar with Arduinos are familiar with the idea of uploading a program image to the microcontroller for use. Well, you can't really do that with the MOSTEC 3870. The contents of the ROM are burned into place when the 3870 chip is manufactured in the factory. If you wish to order some 3870s, you had to provide MOSTEC with an image of the binary you wanted to be in the ROM. According to the data sheet, the binary image could be provided in a programmed ROM, a floppy disk, or even punch cards or punch tape. Now that's really the 1970s there. To dump the ROM on the MOSTEC 3870, we need to take advantage of a special pin on it called the test pin. In normal usage, this pin is grounded, and indeed it is grounded on the teammate computer. However, if it is set to certain voltage levels, it will change how the microcontroller works. If the test pin is held at TTL logic level or about 3.5 volts, the port 4 pins will output the contents of the internal data bus, and the port 5 pins will become a wired OR input to the same internal data bus. Furthermore, if the test pin is set to twice the TTL logic level or about 7 volts, then the internal ROM is additionally prevented from driving the internal data bus. Given this behavior, a circuit could be designed that would allow a more modern microcontroller to force certain instructions onto the MOSTEC 3870's data bus that would in turn cause it to write its ROM content to the data bus. Once the ROM content is written to the data bus, we can read it on port 4 of the 3870. Here is a schematic of the circuit that will do just that. This design is heavily inspired by an older design I found created by a person named Sean Riddle back in 2011 for his project to dump the ROM of a chess game that was also driven by the MOSTEC 3870. I'll place a link to his project down in the description. The important elements of this schematic is that I'm using an ATmega1284P to drive the MOSTEC 3870 
and force the instructions onto the data bus as I described. These LM317Ts are used to generate the various voltage levels needed. Two for the 3.5 and 7 volts I described, and one to supply the MOSTEC 3870 with its optimal operating voltage. Finally, this 4066 chip is a digitally controlled analog signal chip which is used to control which voltage levels are presented to the test pin on the MOSTEC 3870. The software that is loaded onto the ATmega1284P is fairly straightforward, so if you'd like to review it, I'll place a link to a repository that contains it in this video's description. But I'm not going to go over here in detail in this video. Here is the dumping circuit built out. A UART connects the overall circuit to my computer here so that I can actually get the output from it. Here is the MOSTEC 3870 that I took out of my teammate computer, and this is what I'm going to be dumping. This is the ATmega1284P that controls the dumping process, the LM317Ts that set the various voltage levels, and here's that digital switch, the 4066 chip. Okay, now that I got all in place, let's go ahead and dump it. I will connect the power to the board. I notice my power supply is set to 9 volts. That These LM317s will actually convert the 9 volts into various voltages that are needed. I turn it on. And here, I get the uh, prompt out of my ATmega1284P. Now, I program the ATmega1284P to pause before it starts. The dumping operation. I did this to give me a chance to verify the various voltages and connections before the process begins. This was just me being conservative and cautious. Things check out, so let's kick it off. Hey, it worked. So what you see here is the dump was printed out to the screen in the Intel hex format. And so I need to convert this Intel hex format to a binary file. So let's go ahead and select it since this is in my terminal program I, it doesn't go directly to a file so i have to use a good old copy paste to make this work copy it move to my text editor and paste it into a text editor file and then let's go ahead and save that now to convert it to a binary file uh, let, I'm going to be using this package, this Python package called Intel Hex that allows me to convert it into the actual binary file. Um, I already have it set up here. The input will be the teammate ROM hex file. I'm going to print it out to a teammate ROM binary file. Binary. Okay. It is converted. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at a hex dump of that binary file. That did not print it out in big Indian format, so let's go ahead and change that. Okay, that's better. That's what I was looking for. Okay, so this is the, the binary dump. These are the, um, the various byte codes. This is the first byte code. I know what this one is, which is a disable of the interrupts, and then so on. I do want to convert this into actual assembly code that I can then edit and understand what's going on rather than trying to look at this, these individual byte code values and trying to figure out from that. So I will. Let's go ahead and do that, convert that to assembly. To do that, I actually have a tool, F8 tool. Someone already wrote a disassembler, so I'm going to F8 disassembly, the teammate ROM binary file, and I am going to dump that into the teammate ROM F8 assembly. Okay, let's take a look at that. Open the that up. Okay, here it is in the original assembler for, format. I'm actually going to be converting this into my bespoke ASM assembler format. Not a significant difference. There's this certain details that I will have to change. One thing you'll notice that all of these labels 
their actual text value is actually the address that the label is at. It's not too helpful from a human perspective. So I'm going to be going through all this and just reading the code, trying to understand what is going on and uh, rename these labels to something that is a little bit more understandable. And then once I have that, I can then possibly write a program. I won't be doing that in this video. I'm going to save that for my next video, but I just wanted to give you a preview of what I've been able to do and the fact that I actually have my ROM dumped from my teammate game computer. Success. So I'm happy about that. Now to prove that this is a successful dump, what I'm going to do is to take this ROM file that I've this binary file that I've dumped from this MOSTEC 3870 and I'm going to burn it on to a EEPROM and then put that EEPROM on the MOSTEC 38P70 and place that 38P70 back into my teammate computer to see if it works. So let me go do that and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Now I'm going to tell you that took longer than I expected. I did get the ROM that I just dumped onto this EEPROM right here, this 2716 EEPROM, and I connected it to the MOSTEC 38P70 and put the MOSTEC 38P70 in place to replace the original MOSTEC 3870 that we just took out. Now, when I first turned this on and to test things off off camera, it didn't work. I mean, LEDs came on, something kind of happened when I pressed the buttons, but it wasn't behaving in a manner that I would expect it to behave like it did when I had the MOSTEC 3870 in there. In fact, I took this out, put the original chip back in, it worked fine, and took the original chip out, put this back in, and it kind of screwed things up again. I thought that possibly the dump went bad and basically the software that I have on the EEPROM right here was bad. So I double checked things. I dumped it a few more times, got a few exact results. I tweaked the code a little just to see if something was going on there. It wasn't it. It wasn't it. So I dug into the data sheets and looking at the data sheets, I noticed something. At the end of the data sheets, they have this order form, the order form that you would use to order your MOSTEC 3870. Now remember, you ordered the MOSTEC 3870 and you provided them with the ROM image you wanted to be burned on the chip because the ROM in this chip got burned at the time the chip was manufactured. So you had to provide that information up front and then, you, of course, you ordered these chips in bulk because that's how you use it. You'd only buy one of these programmable chips just because that's what you use for development purposes. Anyway, when I was looking at this order form, one thing I noticed is that you can notate whether you want specific pins on this chip to have a pull-up resistor or not. Specifically, I noticed that the reset pin right here, you could have a pull-up resistor or not. Now, if you look at the schematic that I reverse engineered for this teammate computer, you'll notice that the reset pin connects directly to a switch, which then connects directly to ground. And so what that would indicate to me is that the original MOSTEC 3870 that was used to build a teammate computer did have a pull-up resistor assigned to the reset pin. And so my theory is, is that the, this 38P70 does not have a pull-up resistor on the reset pin. And so I tested things out, and yeah, that proved to be the case. So to be able to use this 38P70 in the teammate computer, I went ahead and made a modification to the motherboard. Specifically, I added this pull-up resistor right here from the reset pin to, which conveniently, VCC is right next to it. Now, I'm going to have to tidy this up a bit and possibly put some electrical tape on there so that nothing gets shorted against all of these exposed traces. But for now, you know, for testing purposes, I put it in place and, it, and hopefully it will work. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get this tested out and make sure that it works. So let me connect the power. So I'll connect negative to the negative lead, which is right here. And positive to the positive lead. And let's go ahead and turn on power. And we have life. They get the startup pattern on the LEDs as expected. So let's go ahead and run a program. Let's run that first program I ran at the beginning of the video, which is just a pattern on the screen. So I press P3, 8, 
one. Anyway, P1. And then I got to enter a speed code. Let's go ahead and do 99 P1. There we go. The pattern's working. And just to make sure everything's working, let's go ahead and run the, the music song, which was P3 8E P1. Okay, enough of that. I do remember as a kid playing that song and uh, annoying the rest of my family. And I kind of understand now why, now that I'm older. Nonetheless, so this works now. And so let's uh, go ahead and get that pattern running again. And 6-6. Six, six. There we go. So this works now. And what I have done is demonstrated that I can program this computer with a custom ROM. Of course, right now, the ROM that is being used is an image of the original ROM, but I can change this out and run whatever code I want now. So this is an important milestone in my goal of being able to run my own code on this computer. But I'm going to end this video here. I have accomplished the major milestone of demonstrating an ability to run custom code. And so in the next video, I'm going to move build on that. First of all, I'm going to put this back together. I'm going to have to clean this computer up. Notice the, the, put the case back together, you know, the pieces right here. Clean the case up. You can see right here how dirty it is. And just generally make it look better. Then I'm going to have to write code. I'm going to have to figure out how to interface with all this hardware. Having the schematic would be help, is helpful in that. Having the original code is going to be helpful in that. I'm going to have to spend some time kind of dissecting and uh, interpreting the ROM dump that I created. And so that will be the next video. And so thanks for watching this video. Hopefully you found it educational. If you enjoyed it, uh, please do subscribe. I don't publish videos all that often, but when I do, it's content like this. I, I do like to get into the details of things, especially about what I learned from the experience. And so if you like that kind of stuff, do subscribe. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll enjoy the other videos that I put out there. So until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.